All right, kids, it's time to... Hey! Hey! Turn off the brain chips! Listen, old man. President Musk keeps tweeting about Baby Shiba, Inu, D's Nuts, Moon Emoji, Moon Emoji, Rocket Emoji Coin, and we're gonna get rug pulled if we don't watch his thought stream. Oh, you goddamn kids these days. You know, back in my day, we got rug pulled all the time. And we liked it like that. We'd post screenshots on the internet of how much money we lost, and then we'd laugh about it. That sounds like a far worse way of doing things. And while it may seem charmingly quaint now, that doesn't change the fact that it was worse. Oh, you kids, huh? You think you know everything, don't you? Then tell me this. You keep getting killed by a camper with a China Lake on Deathmatch in Nuketown and Treyarch's landmark 2010 entry to the Call of Duty franchise, Black Ops. You know his mic is hot because you can hear his mom and dad arguing while Kesha's TikTok plays in the background. So how do you trash talk him? Call him a capitalist bootlicker? No! You call him a fucking Children. Christ. You see, this is why gaming history is so important, and why I've dedicated my life to the teaching of it. You just tried to explain why your class is important, but that... It, none of that matters. Yeah, I'm not going to need to know how to insult turn-of-the-century children when I'm mining bitcoins at Bezos' Martian mines. Why don't you teach us something practical? <sighs> how do I reach these kids? Are you children aware of Adobe Flash? Flash was a graphics and animation editor, as well as a browser plugin. Originally created by Future Wave Software in 1993, before being bought by Macromedia in 1996, then finally Adobe in 2005, Flash allowed for independent media creation and consumption on the early internet back when the internet existed in mysterious beige boxes. YouTube used Flash to power its video player. MMOs were built and ran on Flash. Complex web applications as well. It was even used to draw and render animations in a time where video hosting and playback was incredibly intensive. Flash powered the internet. Of the late 90s through the mid 2000s, it was the best and most widespread method of displaying anything that wasn't bright green, eye searing text over a black background. However, it would not survive the Internet of Things. This is a day. I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. The internet, beginning with Apple's release of the iPhone in 2007, would begin to exist outside of beige boxes. The internet was on your phone, and before long, it was on your game console and watch and car and fridge. Oh shit, this was a mistake. Go back, go back. Apple wasn't the first company to put internet on a phone but they were the first to make it feel natural. The internet wasn't just on your phone, it was at home on your phone. But Flash wasn't. Apple never supported Flash on their phones and pads and watches. The reasons for this are numerous and somewhat warranted, as this was a time when Apple would remove product features for reasons beyond, uh, we got another dongle we wanna fucking sell ya. These reasons were outlined in then-CEO and turtleneck enthusiast Steve Jobs' open letter, Thoughts on Flash, published in 2010. Flash was created during the PC era, for PCs and mice. Flash is a successful business for Adobe, and we can understand why they want to push it beyond PCs. But the mobile era is about low-power devices, touch interfaces, and open web standards. All areas where Flash falls short. Flash was not compatible with a rapidly changing internet, and after a decade of languishing, it was officially killed off by Adobe on January 12th of 2021. How could Flash have survived? The biggest phone company in the world wouldn't support it, the internet was rapidly expanding far beyond the narrow market for which it was designed, and Flash had to be downloaded and updated, whereas HTML5, a standard which is open and built into every web browser, had been updated to version 5, which did nearly everything Flash already did, 
but without requiring you to update it. Updating Flash was as needed as it was risky as fuck, because it always had your parents appearing over your shoulder and saying, Is that a virus? Are you downloading a virus? Flash games reflect an era of unrestrained anxiety. Most were made in a nation whose privacy was being violated, and which existed in a state of fear, not of the nuclear bombs, which had frightened the previous generation, but fear of idiosyncratic war, perpetuated by those that blended in among us. Are you okay, Professor Cobbler? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, uh... uh how would you understand? Why are you talking about some dead browser plugin as if it has any bearing whatsoever on us now? There's a Flash game which is permeated with the anxiety of a time before yours. It is called Oligarchy, and it is about a moment which never arrived. Drillin', 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 now, though them boats keep spillin', now, keep them lyrics drillin', aboard boy! Oligarchy is a Flash game which I played endlessly as a young pie, and the setup is simple. You are an oil man in 1945, and your job is to drill. You search for oil, you extract it, and the more you extract, the more money you make. You begin in Texas. You don't have access to the oil in Iraq for political reasons, nor access to the oil in Alaska for environmental reasons. But this is not a problem. There's no benefit to producing more oil than the world consumes. However, consumption increases year over year. If you can't match it, you lose. Every 10 years, you can use your profits to bet on elections. As a kid, I'd try betting on just one singular party, but of course, I would later realize that betting on both is the move. Don't get attached to either side. There's no ideological differences here. It's red versus blue. The amount of money you donate to each party should be roughly proportional to how successful each party is. This is how you impart a message through gameplay. If you jam enough cash into the elections, you get access to the secret room, where you can enact oiled policies, manufacturing consent, launching wars, and opening up Alaska to the drill. Of course, doing these morally dubious things in Nigeria doesn't require bribes to be obfuscated. In order to keep the oil flowing there, you are given a literal menu from which to select policies. It is, in practice, the exact same mechanic. But oligarchy was built around a single thing, a single scientific theory. That's right, a game theory. But less fun, because it's about an entire species putting a brick on the gas and running over the cliff of mutually assured destruction, and not that purple guy or whatever fuck you at peak. Oil. Oligarchy is meant to popularize peak oil as a key issue to understand present and future crises, and to contribute to the reframing of the vague and deceptive argument of dependency on foreign oil that is dominating the current political discourse in the US. Peak oil is a theory that world oil production is a bell curve. There would be a peak, but demand would continue to rise. U.S. oil production by the release of Oligarchy had peaked in 1970, but the U.S. had been extracting and consuming oil much earlier than other places, so world oil production was going to peak in 2005 or maybe 2010. It, you know, maybe. What would happen if world oil production peaked? Well, if you were a person living in America in the early to mid-2000s, you could guess. Iraq was to be the first of many oil wars. Oil fuels nations, and with worldwide oil production to peak in the imminent future, the U.S. was being proactive by installing a U.S.-friendly regime in a nation with the world's fifth-largest oil reserves. The 2010s was sure to be a decade of resource wars for the last remaining oil on Earth. And also, Madonna's gonna make a lot of music about it. I'm drinking a soy latte. I get a double latte. So you can see how dire the situation is. You may have noticed that none of that happened. U.S. oil production did not peak in 1970, but experienced exponential growth this past decade. Peak oil is no longer a common talking point for a very simple reason. If you push highly pressurized fluid, into shale rock, you can dramatically increase the efficiency of gas and oil extraction from said shale rock. This process is called hydraulic fracturing. You know it as fracking. 
a controversial topic, but I'm not about to dive into that shit because I can read a book about peak oil and oil wars and conspiracies and, you know, all that shit, but I refuse to read a book about how fracking works and it's still a contentious topic with a great deal of misinformation, and I don't have the time to get to the truth on this matter. Still working on the Rome video, I promise. But I'll leave you with this one thing, which I find fascinating. In order to meet demand after peak oil, you can begin liquefying humans. There are three possible game overs for oligarchy, and I'm gonna use the creator's post-mortem to summarize them. Fired. In the pre-peak phase, the player can be fired for bad management if the demand exceeds the offer for too many years. Ending two, mutually assured destruction. The hardcore gamer will probably see the mutually assured destruction ending that represents the failed transition to a post-carbon society. This global nuclear war scenario happens when the oil prices reach the ceiling of $300 per barrel and is usually the result of aggressive and persistent efforts to control the government. By buying off the politicians, the player essentially introduces rigidity into the system and prevents a harmonic rearrangement of the society. Ending 3. Retirement Retirement usually happens when the player loosens the grip on politics around or after peak oil. It is basically the happy ending, though it can be reached after some major catastrophes. At the end of the day, good gamers tend to get rich and blow up the world, while the bad, lazy, or non-competitive gamers may reach a tragic end. What I find so fascinating and poignant about oligarchy is the rigidity into the system which the player creates via corruption of the government that leads to the mutually assured destruction ending. While peak oil has just not panned out, Corruption leading to a government incapable of pivoting and course correction is something I think we're witnessing right now. A government that has been so eroded by special interests and electorate fuckery that it has been rendered incapable of anything but siphoning money from the many and depositing it into the pockets of the few. Raise the interest rates, Powell. Do it, you cuck. You cannot just sell a commodity, an oligarchy, because the world's governments will read the writing on the wall and take measured steps towards common sense reforms, which will eventually wean John Q. Public off of your oily teat. So, you must ensure, through government programs, warfare, and misinformation, that the commodity will be accessible to you and only you and always in high demand. The government and oligarchy, by the end, if you're a pro gamer like me, is essentially the marketing and security arm of your oil company. I really do love the escapism in games. A nice touch is that if you gain and then lose control of Iraq militarily, your wells remain, but they're flying Iraqi flags because the oil was presumably nationalized by some stupid fucking commies that don't know what's good for them. But all of that aside, peak oil did not come. And I'm no geologist, but it seems like it won't. The Hubbard theory of peak oil, which oligarchy was based on, is this red line. And green is actual production. This is just in the lower 48 states. Improving technologies have continued to allow for increased production. War in the Middle East has thankfully ended, at least as far as the US is concerned. Uh, you have been saved, Iraq. You are welcome. Hubbard's peak oil theory centered more around the loss of easily accessible oil, which was cheap to extract and refine. The core argument being that we would be driven towards consuming harder and harder to extract oil sources, eventually being reduced to oil sources that are more energy intensive to extract and refine than they're worth. Uh, it's sort of like how you keep seeing asteroids and news stories that are worth like 80 trillion dollars or whatever in precious metals, but it wouldn't just be hard to extract the metals, it would be more expensive than, you know, 80 trillion dollars or whatever. If you want some precious metals, get some African children and a shovel they can all share. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm not a geologist. I like history and video games and finance and not talking to women because they don't give a shit about any of those things. However, it seems that the consequences of climate change are coming at us a hell of a lot faster than oil becoming so scarce that it leads to geopolitical instability. Oligarchy was not about climate change. It was about peak oil. And nothing is about peak oil anymore. The discourse around hydrocarbons today has shifted to climate change as the thing to be feared. 
Do not mistake this video as an anti-climate change argument. It's climate change and peak oil are two separate things. This video is an argument about game preservation, as the loss of oligarchy, a goddamn flash game, would have represented a significant loss. La Molindustria is an indie developer and filthy fucking red who has made many games with a political message. There's another of his that I played a lot as a kid, you might have as well. It was named by him simply McDonald's video game, but is usually hosted on sites like Addicting Games under Burger Tycoon. Thankfully, Oligarchy has been preserved. You can download an EXE of it right now, Safe Punjabi No Virus, from gamesforchange.org, or La Mole Industria's actual website, or you can even use Flashpoint, which is a community that created a launcher and is preserving all these old Flash games. What Oligarchy lacks in gameplay, it makes up for as a time capsule. It is permeated with raw anxiety, and it could not have been made in any other time. So what's your point? Well, children, you just learned about Hubbard's theory of peak oil, American military intervention in the Middle East, and its effect on the political discourse, an old web standard and its historical significance, as well as the evolution of the internet. Yeah? But you learned all those things through a discussion about a video game. Isn't that cool? It's like learning about slavery through a discussion about Uncle Tom's Cabin or ancient Greek cultural norms through Homer's epic poems. Art is an exceptional tool for learning not just about the art itself, but how that art is a reaction to and or a reflection of the way people used to live and what they lived through. That's why I teach video game history, because they came into artistic maturity at a very important time, filled with social unrest, growing wealth inequality, and racial tensions. You know what, old man? You're right. There's so much to learn through video games. You said during a drunken rant in yesterday's class that you ran a YouTube channel about games during the early 20s, right? Indeed I did and it was terrible. Well, what were some games that came out then which were like oligarchy? There must have been a lot of very politically charged games from that time which will help us connect to our past. Yeah, and you must have said and written a lot of things about these undoubtedly dense and ideologically diverse video games. Oh. Um. Uh. What? Well. Mate. No. But, but, uh, uh, okay, well, no. Yeah, no. <sighs> oh, wait, uh, no, that's, that's nothing. Um, okay. Um, there was a gay in The Last of Us.